Good morning, Holy Trinity. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost. I'm so happy you are all here today. A few announcements before we get started. After our service, we do have hospitality downstairs. A big thank you to Marg for hosting it today. So after service, a warm cup of coffee and some snacks downstairs afterwards. A few announcements about this week. Wednesday, the church building will be closed for National Indigenous Day. We do ask everyone, especially on Wednesday, to take a few moments and read some of the references that we have sent out in our weekly announcements and stuff you can find online to help further educate ourselves on why this day is so important. Your bulletins, if you weren't here this week, nope, you are here this week. If you weren't here last week, <laughs> We launched our new summer bulletins. That white copy has the order of the service. That we just put in the basket at the back at the end. Your colored insert has all your hymns, has a synopsis of the readings, and has the psalm refrain on it. That can get recycled. We are doing this this summer as a means to help the environment go through less paper and not spend as much money. So we do ask your help in not recycling the white copies, just putting them in the basket, but recycling your colored copy. On June 30th, right here, that is a Friday at 7 p.m., we will be having a Family Pride Month karaoke night down right here in the lower hall. Annie, our newcomer young adult and social justice coordinator, has organized this, and it's going to be a blast. It is family friendly, so 7 p.m., lower hall, karaoke, it'll be a blast. In our announcements that were emailed out on Friday, you may have seen a request for prayers. What we really meant was a request for prayer leaders. Through these summer months, we have less and less prayer leaders, so we're hoping to simplify it in order to get more takers. In the BAS are pre-written litanies that take maybe three minutes to read, and we are more than happy to revert to using our litanies if that would entice you to want to come up and lead the prayers. So if that entices you, please do let me know. Like I said, we are desperately in need of some more prayer leaders. Next Sunday, June 25th, is a very special Sunday. Our kids' church is going to be after service downstairs, downstairs presenting what they've been working on all year, and this is a replica of Jerusalem. So please do come next week and come to hospitality and have a peek at what these kids have been working so hard on this whole past year and what our teachers have been working so hard on as well this past year. With that said, I invite you to take a few moments as we prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into morning worship. I invite the congregation to please stand as able as we sing our opening hymn, number 631, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray the collect of the day. God of love, in your compassion you reach out to the lost and helpless. Continue this work through us so that your reign of justice and peace may increase through Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated and I invite any kids present to come on forward. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone this morning on this wet, wet morning? Are we good? Are we looking forward to school being over? Mm, that's fair. I have a question for you. Which one of you or who among you has heard the word disciple? Fabulous. This is an A+. Plus. Who has heard the word apostle? Who knows the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Oh. I feel like I've heard it by I feel like half the adults are going, we're not sure either. Like the Sunday school teacher. Yeah, like the, Heather said, like the Sunday school teacher, because I don't know the difference. So we're all disciples, right? We've heard that, that we are all disciples. So disciples, I like to think of disciples as learners. Like students when you're in school. Like this year, you guys are all disciples of whatever grade you're in, what you're learning. So disciples in the church, we are learning about the Bible. We are learning about Jesus Christ and God and Moses and Daniel and all of these amazing people. We're learning. Now apostles, this is where it gets confusing, apostles are also disciples. But apostles, the very name, apostle means to be sent. So we often talk at the end of the service, we do a dismissal that says, go forth into the world rejoicing in the joy of the Spirit. That is us being apostles, we are being sent forth. So when we're going out into the world, when we're loving people, when we're showing kindness and hospitality, when we're feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting those in jail, that is us doing apostle work. But we're still learning, so we're still disciples, too. What do you think it's easier to be a disciple or an apostle? What do you think? Uh, disciple. You think a disciple? What about you? Apostle. Apostle, what about you? Disciple. disciple. Okay, congregation, show of hands. Disciple? Apostle? Or does it depend on the day? <laughs> Fabulous. So we're all called to be disciples. We're all asked to go forth and be apostles. And we have to do them both at the same time, and sometimes just one at a time. And it's really hard sometimes, isn't it? Do we want to give up sometimes? But do we ever give up? Because we know what? One time I did. <laughs> one time you did give up. 
I like where this is going. It's happened, it's happened to all of us. We've all been there. I sometimes want to give up too, but do you know what I remember? I remember that as a, as a disciple who is learning and as an apostle who's supposed to share the love of Christ, if I do a really bad day sometimes, God still loves me. God loves me when I do great. God loves me when I do bad. God just loves me. And that helps me to be a disciple and it helps me to be an apostle. Yes. Do I think I would get frustrated if you asked me again and again and again what I said? Yeah. No, I'd probably just write it down and hand it to you. <laughs> Cut out the middleman. But I say it again and again that God loves you, don't I? And do you know why I say that again and again and again? And it's probably so boring and you're so tired of hearing me say it, but do you know why? We're in church. Because we're in church, <laughs> but more importantly, astute observation. More importantly, it's because it's true. God loves you. God loves each and every person here, whether you're doing great, whether you're not doing so great, whether you feel good, whether you don't feel good, whether you're being a disciple, whether you're being an apostle, or whether you're just sleeping and don't want to do any of it, God loves you. And I think that's worth celebrating. So before we go downstairs and you guys get to work on your Jerusalem project, oh, finishing it up, what should we do first? Come on. What? Pray. Pray. There we go. All right. This is the repeat after me prayer. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, thank you for helping me be a disciple, and thank you for being with me when I'm trying to be an apostle, and thank you for always loving me, whether I can do both or none. Whether I can do both or none. Amen. Amen. Fabulous. I invite the adults to be upstanding as we sing our kids off to kids' church. I invite the congregation to be seated as we listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat by the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready, quickly, three measures of, of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk, and the calf that had been, he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. 
Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind them. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced and aged. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, I shall have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the same time, at the set time, I shall return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did <laughs> laugh. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this great peace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Cananine. And Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. 
So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them about the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your creator speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. And these are the names of the twelve apostles. Wait a minute. Something's happened here. Something important. But it goes by so fast, we may not have noticed it. In the first sentence, they're disciples. Then suddenly, they're apostles. What happened? Even if you caught the change, we may not have paid much attention. Disciples and apostles, what's the difference? They're just interchangeable names for the same 12 people, aren't they? What's the big deal? All over the country at this time of year, there are young people and not so young people making the same kind of transition. My Facebook feed, my Instagram reels, and my Twitter are full of commencement speeches, lists of graduates, pictures of young people tossing graduation caps into the air, to celebrate their change in status. One minute, they're students, still in training, still learning the ropes, the rules, the formulas, the structures. Then comes the moment of graduation. Diplomas in hand, shifting tassels from one side to the other, grinning for pictures with their support systems, and suddenly, they're somebody else. They're something else. They're no longer students, but graduates, ready to go out into the world to practice what they've been learning for all of these years. They're no longer disciples, learning the disciplines of their craft or trade or profession. They are, in effect, apostles, people being sent out into the world to do what they've been discipled to do. This is, after all, what apostle means, someone who is sent out. The gospel from Matthew marks the moment when the followers gathered around Jesus as recent graduates, when Jesus seems to have decided that they knew enough, that they were formed and shaped and changed enough to be sent out to share the mission and ministry with Jesus. Unlike our contemporary graduates, it wasn't that they'd completed a nice, tidy set course with the required numbers of credits and proficiency tests and final exams and papers, because discipleship isn't as easily marked out and measured as that. It was more a matter of Jesus deciding that he'd taught them all that he could at least for the moment. And Jesus knew that the world needed their ministry 
and the world needed it now. For several chapters before this story, Jesus has been traveling around healing and teaching, and the crowds are building. More and more people keep coming with their pain and their need and their troubles, harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, as Jesus describes them. And Jesus looks on them, and he can see the great need, far more than he alone can reach. And so it's time to add some helpers, to send out laborers into the Lord's harvest. So Jesus called his closest followers, the ones who had been with him the longest and observed him the most closely, and passed on to them some of his power, the power to name and overcome evil, the power to heal and to reconcile, power granted to him by the heavenly creator, the one holy and living God. And then Jesus sent them out with these instructions. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. It is not you who speak, but the spirit of your creator speaking through you. And off they went to do the work in his name as disciples who are now apostles. Did they do it perfectly? No, not at all. The Gospels and the book of Acts tells us over and over again the ways they missed the mark, dropped the ball, fell over their own feet, and generally were the gang that just couldn't shoot straight. They couldn't understand the parables. They didn't know what Jesus meant when he predicted his own death. They slept through his last agonizing hours. They deserted him. When he went to judgment and the cross, they barely recognized him when he appeared to them as the risen Christ. And they hadn't a clue what to do when he ascended into heaven. One of them even sold him to the enemy government for a pocket full of change. And yet, and yet there is a church around the world today witnessing in every nation to the good news of God in Christ. The sun you see never sits on the Christian hope, the faith that proclaims the good news even in the darkest hour. All because the disciples, imperfect as they were, answered the challenge of Jesus to be sent out to proclaim the good news. Our baptismal promises include the promise that we will, with God's help, proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ. That's because we, too, are all apostles. All too often, we're tempted to treat our life in the church as if it were an end in itself. We're happy to gather within the comfort of our worship and our buildings and our communities, just to be in the presence of our Lord. We've been content to be disciples, safely gathered around the table, shutting out the world, and learning more and more. To be an apostle is to risk. To be an apostle is to venture, to step outside of our close supportive company, and into a world of people caught in suffering and in fear. It takes courage to be an apostle. The followers gathered around Jesus weren't much different. They certainly weren't eager to go out there, outside the comfort of the close circle of friends and companions, where they had to be wise as serpents, as well as innocent as doves. But Jesus saw the world, grieving and wounded, and knew its suffering, felt it in his own bones, felt it in his very own heart. He sent out his first apostles to bear the power of God into the struggle with evil, to heal the sick, to bring the reconciliation of love. And he sends us still to do the same. As apostles of Christ, we are called to a seemingly impossible mission, 
to bring healing, reconciliation, and love to the world in the power of the grace of God. Each of us has our own places to which we are called. Families, homes, workplaces, clubs, groups, wherever there are people hurting, searching, and in pain. Our world is as full as Jesus' world was of people who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And like the first apostles, we are called to help and we won't be perfect. We will make mistakes. We're going to miss opportunities. We're going to go back on our word, betray our Lord. But our Lord, our God, is endlessly forgiving. And God keeps sending us back out into the world, into the name of the Creator. The first apostles, our forebears in the faith, turned the world upside down in the power of God. And we can too. My friends, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go out from this church to the world that you live in. Call out and name evil and injustice and sleazy practices and work to change them. Touch the sickness of the world. Fear, rage, racism, homophobia, people set against people, hopelessness, despair, emptiness, and pain and hear it. Say to the world, the kingdom of God has come near, and don't worry about how you're going to accomplish it. The words and the ways will come to you because it will be the Spirit of God moving through you. We are a sent people. We have work to do. We are still learning. Yes, we are disciples, but we are also apostles sent out to share the good news of Christ and to proclaim Christ's resurrection and glory. We are called to dismantle broken systems of injustices and to stand alongside of those who have had their voices and their needs silenced for far too long. We are called to feed the sick, to clothe the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, visit the sick, and love the imprisoned. This isn't easy work. This is apostle work. And this is our mission, should we choose to accept it. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand as able as we confess the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I invite the congregation to assume whatever posture you find most prayerful for the prayers of the people. In response to, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. <clears throat> God of salvation, who sent your Son to seek out and save what is lost. Hear our prayers on behalf of those who are lost in our day, receiving these petitions and thanksgivings with your unending compassion. Lord, we continue to pray for the people of Russia and Ukraine 
as they endure the hardships of their ongoing war. We pray for wisdom and guidance for those in positions of leadership in the conflict, and for those providing humanitarian aid, and for those who have fled their homeland. O oh God, you are our hope and refuge, and we pray that your justice and peace may come to bear in our world. Lord, in your mercy. Protector, Savior, Comforter, we thank you for your abiding love, faithfulness, and compassion. As we face life's struggles, help us to always know and remember that we can find our rest in you. We pray that you will bring your light to the places of darkness in this world and help us to have the courage when you call us to bring your hope and love to the places of brokenness and despair we encounter. We pray that your healing and grace may be known ever anew in our own lives and in the lives of those we know. Lord, in your mercy. In the worldwide Anglican communion, we pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. In our sister diocese of Bouye, we pray for Gisitwe Parish and their rector, Isai Pascal Sundayagaya. Within the Anglican and Lutheran churches of Canada, we pray for Susan, the National Lutheran Bishop, Linda, our primate, and Gregory, our metropolitan. In our own diocese of Edmonton, we pray for Stephen, our bishop, and for Larry, Lutheran Bishop of Alberta and the Territories. In Edmonton, we pray for the people of St. Luke's Anglican Church, for their rector, Nick Trussell, and spouse, Stephanie, and for their honorary assistant, Joyce Meller. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Diocese of Caledonia and their bishop, the Right Reverend David Lehman. In the First Nations community, we pray for Enoch, Cree Nation. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our clergy at Holy Trinity, for Danielle, Robin, and Penny, and for their families, for John and our music ministry, for our children and families ministry, for Annie and our young adults, newcomers, and social justice ministries, for the equally Anglican ministry, and for those who are newly baptized. We pray also for pastors Aaron, Sigmar, and Calvin at Trinity Lutheran Church. In this neighborhood, we pray for Grace United Church and their ministers, the Reverends Chelsea Masterman and Anna Constantin. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we pray for all those on the parish prayer list, lifting up to you from our community Roger, Ed, Gertrude, Natalie, Margaret Ann and family, Mildred, Bill and family, Raul and Shirley. We also lift up to you anyone else from our own lives who is on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Redeeming sustainer, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. 
Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all of our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to please stand as able. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. I invite the congregation to join in our offertory hymn at number 335, How Shall I Sing That Majesty?
God of reconciliation and forgiveness, the saving work of Christ has made our peace with you. May that work grow toward its perfection in all we offer you this day. We ask this in his name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring relief to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, You do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Creator and Son, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven,
We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. The table is set, all are welcome. Our bread this week is gluten-free for all to share in the one bread, one body. There'll be two stations set up this week, one on the floor and one at the rail. Please go to whichever station you are most comfortable. And after last week's debacle, the middle section is standing room only at the front. <laughs>
I invite the congregation to please stand as able. Let us pray. Holy and blessed God, as you give us the body and blood of your Son, guide us with your Holy Spirit, that we may honor you not only with our lips, but also in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. I invite the congregation to join in our recessional hymn, number 486, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <laughs> <laughs> 